Hello everyone. Happy Sunday. I can't see all of you, but it's good to know that I'm in your presence and we're in the presence of the Lord. Um Huh, I'm learning a lot. There's a big difference between knowing God and believing in God. You know, there's a lot of religions, so there's a lot of people who, who say, you know, I believe in God. But to know God is a to me it's a special gift. And I'm learning that um, what I was taught growing up, well, first of all, I am thankful that I was taught that there is a God and that he does care. That I do appreciate. But now I'm, I'm learning that, um, what do they say? Thy will be done, not my own. Which is not easy. You know, as an adult, uh, well, as a child, you know, I used to get mad and, you know, start screaming or acting acting weird. And even as an adult, I want to do it. But if I did it now, people would look at me like, man, who's that weirdo? <laughs> but, uh, so I I do it in my head. I just don't do it out loud anymore. But you know what? I, I pray for um, anyone who's having any kind of difficulty. Whether it's, um, me you know, mental, spiritual, or physical. And I pray that uh, God will heal you of those uh, iniquities that you are going through. And uh, always remember that although, you know, the devil steps in and wants to accuse you of something or do something and you say, aha, see, look what God did to you. But sometimes uh, we have to stop, like, you know, my debt situation. I can't sit there and say, well, God, you knew that I was going to go into debt. So why did you allow me to? Hey, but uh, guess what? We do have choices, and I made my choice, and now I just have to pay it off. Yeah, so I'm learning. Uh, yeah, God is uh, he's he's special. Uh, you know, he's he's not just you know what is it? Uh, fire and brimstone. You do something wrong, you're gonna be punished. <laughs> you know. Well, I knew you were gonna do it anyway. So you know, with that, um, uh, I say amen, and I just say uh, have a wonderful, beautiful day. Amen. Push three. All right. All right. Whatever. All right. So, uh, yeah, welcome back. Let me see. Take a pause for a moment on here and make verify that my face is centered. Um, yeah, it is. Uh, can't get any uglier than that. Okay. So as we've been uh, discussing over and over again, if you got any questions, um, Feel free to email me or ask you guys right out here. If you got questions, you raise your hands. Uh, but for online, uh, or even you guys, if you look on this online, which I hope you, hopefully you do, and you have questions, go to my mail uh, to my uh, Gmail account listed right here, and um, pose your question, and I'll give you the answer the best I can. Uh, you could also go to my YouTube channel which I highly advise, um, and uh, watch these videos. And, and if you like them, share them. You know, just push like, but share them. Because if I could get up to, you know, a thousand share of people, uh, subscribers, um, I don't have to be on Facebook, which is really hard. Okay, so that being said, uh we were going to do a baptism today, and so we took a break from Revelation. So I th had to come up with something last night. So last night I spent, uh, last not last night, uh, Friday, Friday night and Saturday morning, uh, writing another ser sermon. And that sermon I have... Uh, 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 titled Forsaken. How many of you have ever felt forsaken, especially of God, you being Christians? How many Christians feel like they're forsaken? You don't have to raise your hand. I see it going up. I know that. But, you know, uh, you're following God. You're doing everything right. And life is actually seems to be tougher than it was before. 
before you are a Christian. And I've mentioned that to each and every one of you when you come to follow Christ, make a decision, that you must count the cost. Because when you're a warrior, when you're a warrior for Christ, you have to be willing to fight. And warriors fight. They go into battle. Sometimes there's collateral damage in battle. Sometimes people just die that are innocent. But guess what? Our God, when he puts us in battle, no one, no one dies on accident. The only way you die in the battle of God, your physical body die, is if you didn't follow God, God tells you to go right, you go left and step on a landmine. But God told you to go right. Or when your race is done and it's time for you to leave this temple, this body of flesh, um, to be with the Lord, because that's the only way you can. You cannot enter the kingdom of heaven with this body. It's not possible. Nobody has ascended up into heaven in this fleshly body. Okay? And we'll talk. So, talking about forsaken. Now, this word forsaken, let me look at the time. This word forsaken strikes fear and torment to those who seek the Lord. Did you hear me? Fear and torment. Hey, like I said, hey, life's going to get tougher for you. On the way this morning, you, you mentioned, right, that uh, it just seems like just because God says he'll he'll make your life better doesn't mean that it's you're not going to go through some trials and tribulations and you said it differently right but i'm i'm saying the same thing in other words life's not going to get hard for you so forsaken am i forsaken of god i i don't want to be forsaken of god i don't want to be thrown into satan a war against satan and god not be there to back me up so it, it strikes fear and torment to those who seek God. It does not strike tear, fear and torment to people that don't believe in God. Okay? The Hebrew word for forsaken in Psalms 21, uh, which many people uh, talk about, where in Matthew, where Jesus uh, is the recording, Jesus is on the cross and screams out loudly, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? They have taken this completely out of context. So if we look at this word forsaken, I'm putting it up on the internet so you can see it. It has a bunch of different meanings. Now, if you notice, we have the qual, the nafel, the pal, and it should be, the, uh, well, this one, yeah, there it is. There also is a hifidel up there. So, at any rate, you see what this means? In each of these situations, it can mean to repair, right? It can mean to restore, repair. It can mean to desert, but desert is what? See, it's under this nafal. Qual does not have desert. So if it's in the qual, forsaken is not deserting, which most people, most well-meaning Christian pastors teach that God deserted Jesus on the cross when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But if we look at it in the, in the grammar or the Hebrew grammar, we see that that is not the case. God never forsook him. So a uh, reason I am um, leaving this on the qual, because guess what? I looked it up. It's in the qual, okay? It's to leave, to depart from, to leave behind, to leave, to let alone, to leave, to abandon, forsake, neglect, become apostatized, to lose. Or to set free, or let go, or free. So we have to read this in context. So let's go back to my study notes so I don't just totally uh, 
leave this. So this word in Psalms 21, 22, 21 says, To the chief musician, a psalm of David, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? And from the words of thy my roaming. So when you first read this, you understand in the Hebrew that this is David's asking God this question. It's not Jesus. But when we take Matthew's account where Jesus says it, we say, well, it's Jesus saying that statement. So I understand the question. So let's go into some grammar, okay? And it is used, this word forsaken, right here in Psalms 22, verse 1, in the Old Testament, written in Hebrew, is used in the qual stem, which is part of Hebrew grammar. This word is spoken in the second person. How many know what I mean when I spoke, speak in the second person? I'm not speaking about myself. I'm speaking to my audience, about my audience. My audience was really engaged and enthusiastic. Uh, yeah, I could say your name. You know, during you are really involved in my sermon. In my sermon, my is first person. You, if I use your name, is second person, right? So this is not talking about the first person. Okay? Now, and it has the meaning to leave someone. Resulting in their feeling of being alone, abandoned, or forsaken. Did you know what I said feeling? It's not truth. But you could feel that way in your circumstances, right? Now, however, it could mean you are set free just as well. As we read, that word, that Hebrew word, can mean you've been set free. Okay? This is why one must read it, the scripture, in context. Now, before I go do that, well, maybe I'll continue on. Do you guys, are you familiar with Psalms 22? Let me just, for my audience, it's going to take a little time, but let me go and read Psalms 22. Uh, if you got your Bible, I, I didn't bring my Bible to open it up right here. Let me... Um, go on the internet and use the internet Bible right here. Psalms 22, King James Version. Um, let's take it right here. Let's get down. And of course, verse 1 we read said uh, to the chief musician, a Psalm of David, it starts with, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Okay? Verse 2. Oh my God, I cried in the daytime, but thou hearest not. And in the night season, and I am not silent, but thou art holy, O thou that inhabit the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted, and thou didst deliver them. So you can see when we read this, our fathers trusted in you. This is David telling God how he's feeling. He says, our fathers, they cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. But I, a worm, and no man, a reproach of men, and despised a people. All they that see me and laugh me to scorn, they shoot out their lips and they force, they shake their heads saying. Now this is the beginning where Jesus is, is prophesying through David what's going to happen, how he is going to deliver David. But he puts out his position. So this is a, actual prophecies of Jesus that he, he's, a, he's a worm. And no man. He's a reproach of men and despised of the people. They all see me and laugh at me to scorn. They put out their lips and they shake 
they shake their head, saying, He trusted in the Lord, for he delivered him, and let, let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. So this is David saying it, but it's also what happened to Jesus. See, when Jesus was on the cross, okay, the people scorned him and mocked him and says, well, if he's God, let him take us down. Let his God deliver him. And they cries out. And some thought he was crying for Elijah. Let's see if God comes down and delivers him. So it's talking about two different people at the same time. Okay, past and future. But thou art he that looketh at that took me out of the womb. Thou said, make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my be mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Now many bulls have come past me. Strong bulls of Bashah have beset me around. They gasp upon me with their mouths as raven, raven, ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaw. And thou hast brought me into the dust of the earth. For dogs have come past me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. So right here we can see this, is, this whole lineage, this whole statement beforehand is talking about Jesus. Because we have no record of David having his hands and feet pierced. This is clearly talking about Jesus. I may tell I may tell all my bones they look and stare upon me they part my garments among them and cast lots for my vesture but be thou what what does that say but be not thou not like I first said but be thou but be not thou far from me O Lord O my strength Hasten to help me. So this is the cry of Jesus. Deliver my soul from the soul, the sword, my darling, darlings, from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me. God help me. God has heard him. God did right here. This verse, verse 21, <laughs> says emphatically that God did not forsake Jesus because he prayed to God and God heard him. Okay? He didn't turn his back on him. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise thee. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. All ye, the seed of Jacob, glorify him and fear him. All ye, the seed of Israel. For he hath not despised or abhorred the afflictions or the aff afflicted. Neither has he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard him. So God did not hide his face. The word says God did not forsake him. He did not abandon him. Okay. My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear me. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord. And all the kindreds of nations shall worship before thee. So Jesus is telling David, hey, you're going to be delivered from this. You and Israel, you as an individual and you as a nation. For the kingdom is the Lord's and he is the governor among the nations. All they that be fat upon earth shall eat and worship. All they that go down to the dust shall bow before him. And none can keep 
alive his own soul. A she seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. There they shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto the people that it that shall be born, that he hath done that. So this word that he hath done, when you read it in the Hebrew, it, it is finished. So when Jesus is on the cross, he speaks the very first part of this uh, psalm and says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he finishes this statement before he gives up the ghost and says it is finished. He is quoting Psalms 22 to the people that are watching him telling him seeing like god we put our trust in you you've forsaken us you have abandoned us we're here they're crucifying you and they very likely will crucify us or punish us we trusted in you and you have forsaken us so jesus is doing what is considered stringing the pearls because guess what? When Jesus was reading in the Torah, when Jesus was reading the Psalms, there was not chapter 22. How did you know the context? How do you know that this was what it was? You would start with the very first verse, what we call verse, and you end with the very last. It's called stringing the pearls. That's how he's talking. He's saying, remember this was prophesied about me by King David. So the context of the Psalm 22 is King David feels God has lifted his protection that once covered himself in all Israel. Didn't God walk and, and David walk around and killed Goliath because of God's protection? He even proclaimed that God would uh, protect him in his the taking King the Goliath, the giant. Through all his battles, God has protected him. Even when it didn't look like God was protecting him, he later looked back on it that God has protected him. So when he writes this psalm, his, his a reason for writing it, even though God, the Holy Spirit, inspires him to write the prophecy of what Jesus is going to do, He's filling out a source. He's feeling that God has rejected him. Okay? Uh, that the covering he once had is, is gone. Now, Jesus lovingly begins to explain to David through showing him his plan. Thus, David recognizes G God hasn't left him at all, but already has put together a plan of escape. Jesus shows David he himself will be the one sacrifice of God. This sacrifice will include him being whipped, beaten, and then finally crucified, which David has no knowledge of as it had not been used on the earth up to this point. So when David is receiving this prophecy and writing it down that his bones are exposed because they whooped and, and, and tore his the bones off the flesh of his back with that whip in Pilate's Praetorium, when he says his mouth clay is dried and cleaves to his, his, his roof of his mouth, basically, he he when they pierced his hands and feet nobody had crucified there's no record of anyone ever committing uh, performing a crucifixion so he explains what this crucifixion looks like so we read the majority of the psalms 22 is explaining to jesus i mean to david what this crucifixion looks like cuz he has no point of reference Therefore, Jesus explains in detail what this looks like. Furthermore, he explains this is not for Israel's sins, a verb, action, but is salvation from the camp 
of Satan. So Israel is taken over by Satan, the camp of Satan. How is that so? How was Israel, David's kingdom, overtaken by Satan? It's a great thing to ponder. One is the law, the Mosaic law, which was given to people not to bring them to salvation. Realize if one was to keep the whole entire Mosaic, <laughs> excuse me, perfectly, they still would not get eternal life. They would have a happy, prosperous life on earth. They'd be well-to-do. Their children would grow. There wouldn't be miscarriages. There wouldn't be any plagues. But they would just have a great life on earth, but not salvation, not eternal salvation, not eternal life. Uh, the Word of God tells us that the law was given to sin, Satan, so that he would have power and authority to bring destruction. See, sin had no power except through the law. Nevertheless, it reigned on the earth before the law. But you know a king can reign with no power. Uh, anyone ever hear about Queen Elizabeth? Yeah. She has no power, but she reigns. But before, the, the kings of uh, England had power, and so did their queen. Now, finally, he, showed, he, I'm talking about Jesus, shows David he will give up his spirit into the heavenly Father's hands, just as we must, if we are to keep safe in the place of the dead before we are resurrected and placed in a celestial body, which has no further need of blood. Remember, the terrestrial body cannot enter the kingdom of God, for flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of God. Neither does corruption inherit incorruption. So when you die... The Word of God tells us, uh, I should have wrote this for a reference, but uh, Michael the uh, archangel uh, fights with the devils over, over the body of Moses. And he says, the Lord rebuke you. So when you enter to that spiritual realm where the devil is, it's not hell. It's not a place of torment. It's just the spiritual realm where the devil roams about. He had access to Moses and was going to do something with Moses. But the angel rebukes the devil in the name of Jesus, or in the name of the Lord. Okay, but the point is, is we need protection when we're in there. Just like the angel protected Moses. We need protection, and he offers that protection. Uh, but there will be a time when we're given a new body, a, a new uh, a, 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 a celestial body instead of this terrestrial body. The Word of God clearly says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doeth corruption inherit incorruption. So this means Elisha did not go to heaven when he was taken up in the whirlwind. Now many churches or teachings will say Elisha went up, or Elijah, I'm sorry, went up in a chariot of fire into heaven. It, the Bible does not say that. He went up in a whirlwind in the heaven the heavenly, where birds fly, okay? It does not say he went to the throne of God to be with God at all. Other scriptures clearly state that he was alive after this point, finishing the commission that God had given him, okay? But when you die, you do not go to heaven. You go to be with the Lord, but you don't go to heaven. So how's this work out? So, you know, we're not the first one to have this problem. When, when in Jesus' time, they had this uh, idiom, this story, 
called Abraham's bosom to kind of explain where the Jewish people went when they died until uh, God set them free. And, and one side were the righteous and the other side the unrighteous. Okay? Um, this is a concept that has been well established that we will be somewhere with God, but it is not the throne of God. Okay? Now, the Greek word, so that was the Hebrew word, right? The Greek word for forsaken in Matthew 27, uh, 46, which I've, I've talked to you about, but it says, And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthasia. That is to say, my God, my God, why hath thou forsaken me? So this word forsaken right here has a Greek word, a Greek meaning. Let's kind of look and see what it means. So the Hebrew word for Psalms, for the prophecy of what the Matthew, the recorded thing of the fulfillment of that song, uh, prophecy. Guess what it says? Abandoned, desert, leave in straight, leave helpless, totally abandoned, utterly forsaken, leave behind to leave surviving. So Psalm's prophecy that God would not abandon him, his prophecy that he would not leave him helpless, his prophecy that he would not be forsaken, but he would be left behind among. Here, so you're left behind among something. Jesus was left behind among the children of men, among those he, he needed to say, among his bride. To be with you is fine, but to be with Christ is better. Absent from the body, present with the Lord, because he has stayed with us until, and protecting us until we get raptured. Now, it doesn't mean he's getting raptured with us. He will come in the clouds, come down to us, but it's in this spiritual realm. It is also a verb not a noun. It is also a verb used in the second aorist tense. So does somebody know what aorist tense is? First aorist tense and second aorist tense are exactly the same. They're just spelt differently, okay? Greek had some words like that mean exactly the same thing, just spelt differently. But this is a tense. You know, the aorist tense means neither past, present, or future, but whatever the context dictates. Now, most places in our New Testament Bible, it's in the past tense. But it could be the present tense, or it could be in a future tense. Okay? So it's in this aorist tense. It's in the active voice. Assuredly, I'm doing this. And it's in the indicative mood. I mean, it's a dependent upon what you do. Surely I am saving you, but it depends on how, whether you accept my salvation. Now, he's spoken in the second person singular. Not himself. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He didn't say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken Jesus Christ? Me being Jesus Christ. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Just like Paul, David did, the is Israel, the people of God. Now, it's in the singular. You know, Israel, all of Israel is one person. We are one person. We are the bride of Christ. Jesus doesn't have a lot of brides. He doesn't have a million brides. He doesn't have as many brides as the stars in the sky or the sand or the seashore. How many brides does he have? One. But are we, do we, Christians, the millions of Christians since the resurrection of Jesus, are we not the bride? We're one bride. We're one with Christ. So he's talking in the second person in the singular form, meaning the term second person is referring to the speaker's audience. The speaker's audience. Who's the speaker? Jesus on the cross. My God, my God, 
Why have you forsaken me? Who's he speaking to? The audience, his disciples looking up at him. So I, or example of you, that word uh, you, for example. Here's an example. I'm speaking to you about her. I is the speaker. So I is the first person. You is the person being spoken to. So you is the second person. Do you understand? So Jesus is not talking about himself. He's talking about Israel, the bride of Christ, the true Jewish people. Her is in the third person. So Jesus, so if I'm uh, talking to about her in this example, her would be in the third person. Well, nowhere in this is there anything in the third person. It's only spoken in the second person. So it's spoken to the audience that is right there. At that time, he is speaking. Okay. Therefore, Jesus was quoting Psalms 22, verse 1. Remember, I said it's stringing the pearls. You have this group of people looking up to Jesus, saying, we followed you, we forsaken all we have to follow you. We believed you are the Messiah, the promised Messiah to come. And guess what? You're on the cross dying. Yeah. What are we going to do tomorrow? So Jesus brings to their remembrance this prophecy written way back by the hand of David, starting in Psalms 21, verse 1. Now, he wasn't say or not saying he was experiencing abandonment from God, but this is the crucifixion spoken of in Psalms 22, the whole Psalms. You've got to read the whole Psalm. Psalm, which is to save all of Israel. Again, the scripture does say in the New Testament that all Israel will be saved. Okay? And so all Israel shall be saved as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Remember in Psalms 22 how we read about the righteous and about Jacob? This is in reference. But this scripture was found in Romans 11.26. Now, many people have said, okay, during, during Armageddon, during the end times, that Israel's going to be at battle with almost the whole world, and God's going to come and save all of Israel. No. Who's, Paul, the same writer of this in Romans, says, who is Israel? Not those who have been circumcised of the flesh, but those who have been had an inward circumcision of the heart or the spirit, you could say. So you're saying that Christians are Israel. So Jesus died for you. Jesus didn't die for the nation Israel, but he did because we are the nation Israel. But we're the people that are born of Jewish genealogy are not the nation Israel. They could become one, like Paul, but before Paul was a, a Jew, a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin, okay? He, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was in the Sanhedrin, Hagen, uh, uh, extra biblical accounts tell us. He was the Jew of Jews. He was the man of God, right? But he wasn't of Israel until he became born again until that Damascus Road experience, okay? So yes, all Israel will be saved. How will all Israel be saved? Because if you think just all Israel is going to be saved, you just might think that the people that crucified Jesus will be saved. The, the Pharisees that Jesus talked to and, and spoke to them in parables so they wouldn't understand, so they wouldn't hear, so they wouldn't be converted, so they wouldn't be saved, okay? Would be saved. Because all is all, right? But I could say all Christians will be saved, those that died 2,000 years ago and those that will die tomorrow. You see what I'm saying?
That's what the Word of God says. So why is it important to recognize what the word forsaken means? The use of its tense, mood, and who is it being spoken to? That's a question. Why? That we might recognize how the devil uses the deceived and his false teachers to install a false doctrine that Jesus was abandoned by his heavenly father on the cross, even though he was fully following him up to the point of death. So if God would do that to Jesus, his only son, he'll do it to you. How many of you have followed God all the way to the point of death? To your death. How many, the word says, has resisted sin unto death? And God's going to forsake you? God did not forsake Jesus according to the word of God. God's bride thinks he has forsaken him. God, how come you're so far from helping me? Dude, I ain't far from helping you at all. You just don't see what I'm doing for you. You just don't see the plan I have. You look back at it 10 years later and you go, wow, thank you, God. I see what you were doing. But at the time, you don't see it. Now, there is no greater deception than Satan convincing you God will forsake you if you bear the weight of any sin, whether they are yours or others. How many have you been people have been taught that I can't let this ungodly person come live with me? I can't go lay hands on an ungodly person because I could get contaminated. I cannot go and forgive the sins of a ungenerated person because I bear that sin. They'll take scriptures like don't. Don't be don't hastily lay hands on another, saying that you absorb it. So people won't cast out demons. They won't let a person that is demon possessed come into their house and cast them out. We had an individual, a pastor, that was actually canceling my daughter after she got out of prison. My oldest daughter, okay, and he refused to continue. Uh, uh, counseling her, which was mandated by the uh, part of her parole that she had to go have some uh, counseling. He refused to do it because a demon entered her house and her son's house and his son said that it was screaming all night and was saying that he's seen this monster in his house. So he refused to counsel this woman. Besides being a coward, it, it he doesn't understand that the protection that God gives you because he believes this false teaching that God forsook Jesus. God will not forsake you because of your sins or the sins of others that you may bear. So he won't forget you whether they're your sins or the sins you bear of others. Um, now, this results in you not trusting in the Lord for protection. I've given testimony after testimony how I've walked into gang situation, sick situations, or a situation sickly, people that are sick, knowing God will protect me. But if you think he will forsake you, you can, won't run into that. You won't go into that situation boldly. So when you don't think God's protecting you, when you minister those possessed, sicken and full of doubt. That's why Satan wants you to believe Jesus for God was forsaken by God so that you will think you could be forsaken by God so you won't go fight against his stronghold, his men. If, if the Germans could kept the Americans and Brits from fighting against their camps, they would have won the war. So if they could have had a propaganda going out there 
that there was no war, there was no concentration camp, or there was no prisoners of war camps, there was no concentration camps, nobody would try to go uh, free them. Okay? Now you got to remember, anything done outside of faith is sin. Have you done anything outside of faith? Have you bought a stereo, a car, a vacuum cleaner, a house when God didn't tell you to? Did you buy a house for uh, so much money over asking price when God told you to ask it for below price? See, that's the big thing. Like, how do you know when God is telling you what to do and not to do? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know if you guys heard. The question was, how do you know when God's telling you to do something or not? No. That's a question. How do you know, how do you recognize my voice? If you heard my voice on the phone, not, no caller ID, would you recognize it was me? Yes, I heard it before. Right. If you hear me outside calling you, would you recognize it was me? Yeah. Why? Because we have a personal relationship. So if you can't recognize the voice of God, it's saying you don't have a personal relationship with God. You just know God. You know about God. But what if you get, you just met God? You haven't really registered in your mind what his voice sounds like. You've known God for a year. Okay? You've known me for a year, but you listened to me two times in that year's period. You're not really sure if that was me speaking or not. Man, it sounded like John. I just, I'm not sure. So you got to speak to God on a daily basis. And most of us, when we go to pray, we do all the talking. Yeah. And very few times do we do any listening. So we could be talking to God for years and have never heard his voice because we just haven't shut up. Oh, wow. The word of God tells us I, uh, in Romans 14, 23, and he that doubteth is damned if he eats because he eateth not in faith. For whatsoever is not in faith is sin. So the context of this is eating food, sacrifice the idols. But that's an example that could be fit for anything. Anything done outside of faith bringeth forth damnation. Condemnation. A bad result. Man, I've been praying for God to give me that car. You buy the car. You got it? Now I lose my job. It's a It's been in the shop more than it, I've driven it. I'm making all these payments. I wrecked it. The insurance isn't cut. It, this car is just a piece of junk that I got to make $800 a month payments. And I got three more years or five more years to do this. And I can't even drive this sucker. Right? Because right. you weren't following God. God didn't tell you to buy it. God heard you and he said, I want I want a car for you. But God knew whether that car was the, the car for you or not. Well, you bring up a good point because I have to admit, I was in love, kind of infatuated with those muscle cars. And I said, that's the car I really wanted. But then as I see guys, you know, gas prices shot up and things changed. And then the, I was like, huh, maybe that, that um, Honda Hybrid is maybe a little better. <laughs> It don't sound as good. I'm not gonna lie to you. It don't sound good at all. Yeah, exactly. But I noticed uh, the last time I rented one, the uh, gas the gas tank was on half full, and I filled it up with only like eleven or twelve bucks. Right. Yeah. That 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 sounds pretty good, right? When that when that uh, fuel thing clicks full. Yes. So how is it that we Christians? I'm talking to you and me are never forsaken by God outside of him saying so. So the Bible says God will not for, will never forsake you. But you feel like he has. So how does this work? Let's look at Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 and 6 says, Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. 
No, I'm speaking to. For he that has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that ye may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Now, obviously, this is talking about war accusations. It's not talking about being content with your, your money, but it's talking about being content with your situation, your your position where you are, okay? Um, nonetheless, you are to be content with what you've been in because when you look back, it has always helped you. Now, let's look no further. The question is, is how do we know God will never forsake us, even though we feel like it? Even though his Bible says he won't, how, do, how does that work? How do we know he will never forsake us? So let's look no further than 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, which says, Whosoever is born of God doeth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. Now, we do have this pausing thing. Come on in quickly, Amanda. Thank you for showing up. Uh, go ahead and go back with Des in the kitchen. All right. So let me read this again. And see which one of you say, oh, I can't accept the scripture. But do you believe the word of God is the inspired word of God? Yes, please. Do you believe that? The, the scripture says what it says, and it's there, and it means what it says. Whosoever is born of God, are you born of God? I am. You are? Who else here is born of God? Are you born of God? No, everybody is not. Every born again Christian is. Every new creation is. The old creation was killed, was crucified. It says, whosoever is born of God doeth not commit sin. That is not, doeth not continue to commit sin. That is absolutely the positive negative does not commit sin. Singular. Okay. Uh, for his seed remains in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Why cannot the born again Christian sin? The word this says, because his seed remains in us, and because his seed remains in us, we cannot sin. That's emphatically no, cannot. Now, those of you that no, uh, don't understand that, go ahead and look at 1 John 3, 9, and you could go to, on uh, Blue Letter Bible, and you could look at all this, like, see, I'll just pick the word seed right here. That's sperma, okay? What's sperma? We all know what men's sperma is. That's where you get your DNA, right? Mixed with the DNA of a woman. That's all it means, right? It doesn't mean your genetic offspring for thousands of years down the line. Okay? What that seed means, you know? Okay, so, which shows us the reason we cannot sin, become a sinner, a noun. Realize a born-again Christian can never become a sinner, a noun. Sin could be a noun or a verb. You can't become a sinner. A sinner is a noun. What do sinners do? They sin. They sin, okay? So Jesus became a sinner. Did Jesus sin? No. What, do, what does a sinner do? You just said sin. So the word of God says Jesus became sin. So did G Jesus yes, sin? Yes, he did. He did. Well, that just, the other scripture says he sympathized, tempted in all ways so that he can sympathize with us yet without sin. So how is this possible? We got to understand just because you and I talk today of what sin meant, that does not necessarily mean what it meant in the 1600s or in the Greek. 2,000 years ago. The word sin has many different languages. And the first and most prominent uh, definition is to not have a share in, not be part of something. Okay, 
So it begins to show us that we, born-again Christians, cannot become a sinner, a noun, making us to have a share in the kingdom of God is because Christians have the DNA of Jesus. So because I have the DNA of Jesus, I could never be separated from Jesus. Because I have the DNA of Jesus, I can never be separated from Jesus. So no, all Christians are not born of God. Only born again people are, have this, the, the sema, this DNA of God. Now that born again doesn't mean I killed you and resurrected you. It doesn't mean I killed the old man and resurrected the old man. It, and made him better. It means I killed the old man and made a new creation out of the products of the old man and Jesus' DNA and made a new creation. Just as the Holy Spirit came and impregnated Mary, took what was part of Mary and took what was part of Jesus and a uh, uh, part of the Holy Spirit and made Jesus. We are made a new creation that can never be separated from God because we have the DNA of God. It is impossible. You can, you can try as hard as you want to run away from God once you've been the DNA, but you can't outrun him because he's always there. How can you outrun God? It's impossible. This is why it says in Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10 that it's impossible for those. It is impossible for those that once tasted of the gift of God. That if, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance. For they put Christ to an open shame. And again, if anyone willfully sins, there's nothing left for them but willful condemnation. It's impossible for this to happen. Because if you did, Jesus couldn't die for you again. You cannot go and ask God to forgive you or for sins ever again. It's impossible. Oh, wait a minute. We're just always going back asking <laughs> God to forgive us of our sins. I just told you about where uh, if there's any sin or fault among you, call for the others, elders, and they'll pray for you. And that if you commit a sin, it will be forgiven you. Again, the word sin means different things. But what we're talking about is losing eternal life. And you can only have eternal life in Christ Jesus. It's impossible for you to lose eternal life. Because if you did, you never could repent of it and come back. You never could be a fallen Christian, turn your back on God, and be reunited to God. It's an impossible city. So nobody ever has. Could they have? Yes, but no one's ever has. Well, yes, I sir. A question. So let's say there's an individual, and that individual, well, if you're still drinking, then that means you don't know God. No, not necessarily. So let's say you're still drinking, and then that individual says a bunch of foul things about God. They, yes. That, but that person wants their salvation. Okay, so the question was, if you're still drinking, uh -huh. that means you're a Christian. My answer, you're not a Christian. My answer is no. If you're drinking and cussing and use it and blaspheming God's name, yes. okay, does that mean you lost your salvation? Yes. Is that what you said, lost? That's no, right. it does not mean that at all. God says, writing to Christians, let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth. Why was he doing that? Because people were letting unwholesome words come out of their mouth. He didn't say, oh, you guys that have let unwholesome words come out of your mouth, lay down, go to the altar, repent, ask for the elders to pray for you, give them time, money, penance, and uh, crawl on your knees for a quarter mile. He didn't say any of those things. He said, don't do it. But what if you do? You just need to understand the lie Satan has been telling you that those things will separate you from God and it's impossible. Only thing you do is say, 
that has given Satan an inroad into your life to cause sickness and disease in your life, to cause destruction in your life, because you got a foul mouth. You know, we call it a potty mouth. Or about, do you know, I, you're saying your your mouth is no great. I have no more, more respect for your mouth than a toilet. That's what we're saying. Do you want to talk to somebody about Jesus Christ who has no more respect for what you say than the toilet? So why don't let any unwholesome word come out of your mouth? Because no one hunting for God will listen to you. Okay, how about drinking? Dude, I know people have a problem with alcohol, and if you do, stay away from it, okay? I'm not talking about that, but the Word of God says if you're sorrowful, drink. If you're happy, sing psalms and hymns. <laughs> Timothy, or, or one, of the, the, one of the disciples, for your freaking infirmities in your stomach, take a little wine. So drinking isn't bad. Getting drunk is. Why is getting drunk bad? Not because it separates you from God, but because it opens the door to let Satan come in and destroy your life. Maybe you got a DUI. Maybe you killed somebody. Well, you're going to go to heaven after you spend the rest of your life in prison. There, You, you see what I'm saying? Does that answer your question? Okay, so I was I dropped off. Uh, yes, we have Christ's DNA, and the Word says the Word. The Word of God says we cannot ever be without a share in God's kingdom because we have Jesus' seed. Now that word seed it says because we have Jesus' seed in us sperma. is sperma. And trying to keep this PG, we know what sperm is. That's how people procreate. A male sperma enters a woman and fertilizes the egg. The male sperma gives the egg the genetic makeup of what it's going to be. Male, female, smart, stupid, brown hair or not, black, white, green, yellow, um, I'm green when I'm sick, so there are the green is the color of humans. Okay, so you see what it is? It's just basically uh, the mean, well, exactly what I said. But here it is for people who don't believe me. You can read it on the screen. The definition of sperma. That's where we get our DNA. I have Christ's DNA in me because I have his sperma in me. Do you know, we all know about DNA right now. I get to pick on, do you know you have your father's DNA in you? Get Take it out. Get rid of it. You hate, let's say hypothetically, you hate your dad. You don't want nothing to do with your dad. You disowned your dad. You legally divorced your dad, your family. Get rid of this DNA. You can't. It's impossible. I wouldn't exist. No matter. It's, it's just, that isn't even an issue. Even if you didn't exist, even if you died, you would still have his DNA. If they took and scraped your bone or, or whatever was left a thousand years later, if it was still there, you would still have your dad's DNA. You could never not be part of your dad. Do you understand what I'm saying? You, once you've made that decision to follow God, you can never not be a Christian. That's why I ask you guys, are you sure you want to be a Christian? Because now you're going to have a bullseye on your back and Satan's going to come and attack you. But be of good cheer. God has overcome Satan. All you have to do is put the armor of God on to fight off the fiery darts of the devil. Right? But that means he's going to be firing on you. But the good news is you don't have to succumb to it. But the bad news is you have to fight in battle. Okay? So thus, anyone born of God is a new creation. Now here's the scripture for my argumentative group out there. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. It says, therefore, if anyone be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are new, are become new. So what that means, passed away, is they never existed. 
The new creation never was a mass murderer. Let's say Charles Manson, before he died, right? Let's say he became a Christian in prison. When he goes before the throne of God, there never is going to be one thing about him causing or instigating the death of one person on the face of the earth. Those sins are not even going to be removed. They're going to be as far as the east is from the west. Why? Because that spirit has all already been killed. You were crucified with Christ. It is no longer you that liveth, but Christ that liveth in you. And the life you now live, you live in the faith of God. Now you notice I paraphrase that, putting it in, 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 in uh, not the first person, but the second person. Okay? So, Thus, anyone born of God is a new creation and can not sin, be separated from God, which is to be separated from God, even if they were to sin a verb. What if you willfully sin? Let's try to keep this PGE. What if you have a bad day at work? You have a bad argument with your wife. I'm talking to guys. You decide to go home and go to the pub. You decide to drink alcohol, which I said you can't. You get drunk. And there's a woman there that is there just to comfort you, to make you feel good. You go home with that woman or take her to a motel or whatever, and you do what, you know, the deed. Keeping this PG, Right? Did you lose your salvation? Nope. No, because it wasn't planned. You didn't willfully did it. You did it in ignorance. You were deceived. Nevertheless, could have been a problem. Yeah. Could she got pregnant and now you have a kind of like demon seed kid to take care of? Yes. Could she have given you some disease? Yes. Could she have stolen your credit card and wiped out your entire portfolio taken your house could all these negative things happen to you because of that yes but could it have separated you from god no that is something we must keep it because you're believing and practicing a lie and what is the lie that you will get fulfillment in this woman Right? That's a lie from the devil. The truth of God is to go home and let the wife of your youth satisfy you. Let her breast fat satisfy you. Don't go be looking next door when you've got prime rib at home. Okay? So this brings us to our conclusion. God did not forsake Jesus on the cross. Nor will he forsake you. Period even if you choose not to be faithful to him. How many of us, after following God, have chosen not to be faithful to him? Yeah, your hand, my hand's like way up. How is that possible? Did she say it better be? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> For he, now he is God, Jesus, is always faithful to you. So you're not faithful to God, but Jesus is always faithful to you. Even when you're not faithful to him. Well, give me a scripture, guys. Come on. That Come just on, that just too much. Second Timothy 2.13 says, If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. God cannot deny you because you are a representative of him. You are actually him. It's like I cannot deny that's my son. He has my DNA. He's been a wayward child. He's been in and out of jail. I, I, I can't deny him. He is my son. So because you have the DNA of Christ, God cannot deny you, even if you are unfaithful to him. He remains faithful to you. Now, nevertheless, some of us have a feelings of abandonment, separation, and shame when we stray from God's teaching. Right? If you were to do these things and nothing bad happened to you, say it, you still will feel bad about it. Hopefully. Therefore, God tells us in his word, we are to confess our salts 
if you want to call it sin, go ahead. It's a verb to one another. This is right out of the word of God. Then repent of said action and have your elders in the Lord pray over you to release you from what? What do you think that's going to be? Yes, the power of sin or the inroad, the right Satan, the rights for Satan's demons to take advantage of you. See, when you go do these as the example of what I said, you've given Satan a legal right to destroy your marriage, to lose your job, to lose your whatever. Now, recognize God's word says, if you do this, you will remove any opportunity you gave the devil to be causing destruction in your life. Are you going through destruction in your life? There's people here that this was really directed to that are not here because God is, I mean, God is not causing destruction and the devil is. The devil is, even though they made a profession for Christ, even though they were going to do, even though they were trying, God will never leave them or forsake them. But the devil will take advantage of every inch you give him. You give him an inch, he'll try to take a mile. Okay, so give me a scripture in closing. Well, let's look right here, no further than James chapter 5, and look at verses 14 through 16. Through 16. It says, Is any sick among you? Question. Let him, the sick person, call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him. Why do you need an elder? It doesn't mean somebody pointed in leadership. An elder is somebody that's mature in Christ that eats meat, eats solid food, okay? An elder, and let him pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Verse 15, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. You notice it said sins, plural. So if you've done wrong, you weren't separated from God, but Satan's just having a hey day in your life. If you confess those situations to the elders, to a, a, a person of God that it eat me and knows the power and authority he has and can teach you the power and authority you have, his prayer of faith will what? They shall be forgiven him. The Lord shall raise you up. So if there's any sick, the Lord will raise you up. And if he committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Verse 16, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that ye be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth the much. You want to know why a lot of you are, are not healed? Because you're not confessing your faults to one another. Lord, heal me, heal me of drug abuse. That's great. God could do it, right? But you keep falling into drug abuse. That doesn't make you a bad person. But it doesn't make you separated from God. It doesn't make you not loving God, but it was. It gives Satan an inroad a legal right. So what you need to do is release that legal right. What if you do it tomorrow? You go through the same court procedure and you remove that legal right from Satan. What if you do it in the next week afterwards? You do it again. And you do it again until finally you get so tired of doing it again, you're just going to quit doing it. You understand? So what the point I'm trying to get is God's never going to leave you or forsake you. Whatever you have done and we've all done things we're ashamed of, they will never separate you from God. But they will give Satan an opportunity. But the great news is God is giving you a way of escape. What is it? First Corinthians 10, 13. Anyone that has been overtaken by sin, has been overtaken by sin, by temptation, 
God is faithful and just to not allow you to be sinned more than you can bear. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean he withholds or limits the amount of sin you do. It means he allows you more than you can bear. He gives you, he makes a way for you to get rid of that sin. And we know that that's what it means because at the end of that, his, he has made a way of escape. What's the way of escape? Confessing your faults one to another, having the elders, those who mature, pray for you to release the legal right Satan has in your life. So at least you could start at ground zero instead of starting in the, in the, in the red. Okay? Everybody have a great day. I, I hear the food's going. I don't know why we didn't get it cooked before, but uh, I speak loud enough so everybody could hear. I am sure. <laughs>